Um, my name's Mae Bateman, I'm the Director of Financial Justice Ireland and I'm going to just kick us off um, by telling you a little bit about our organisation and why we wanted to have this session tonight, um, some things we do, and then I'm going to hand over to Rory and Keith and I'm really excited to hear what they have to say and to have enough, enough space for this to be a discussion. Um, so I'm sorry you're all currently forcibly muted, but we will be changing that um, and have hopefully a lively questions and answers session afterwards. So I'm just going to start by sharing my screen um, and just a quick PowerPoint. Um, and just going to get started with telling you a little bit about us. So Financial Justice Ireland, for those who don't know us, we're a small NGO. Um, we were originally founded under the name Debt and Development Coalition Ireland back in 1993. And we were founded in response to the global um, debt crisis in global South countries at the time. Um, we work toward a fair global financial and economic system and focus on the root causes of global inequality and our, root, our, our focus is very much rooted in solidarity and looking at the links between the way the international financial system affects poverty and inequality for people living in Ireland and also in the global south um, and what we can do to change that. So we work on lots of different issues. This is sort of some of a, a quick timeline. We work on sovereign debt, so the debt that countries have, um, tax justice issues, issues to do with public-private partnership and financialization. And this is what sort of led us to working on these funds and working on um, these issues that, that are so relevant to, to housing. Um, we work through campaigning, we work through policy and research, you can get all our things on our website. It's currently being revamped. It's not the easiest to navigate at the moment, but it's all there. Um, and we also work a lot on education. So if there are any um, second level teachers in your life, send them to our website. We try and bring these issues into um, the education system, particularly at second level and, and third level, because ultimately I think we've to bring about a role free from poverty and inequality, we need a just financial system. And one of the biggest barriers to that is people not feeling confident that they understand the problems, that they're able to take action. Um, economics is tricky. It needs to come to And so, one of the things is to try and arrange, um, well, we have our own workshops and sessions and introductory events, but we also try and arrange these expert seminars. So it's an opportunity to get people who know a lot about these subjects to, to talk and to explain them and to have lots of questions and answers so people feel able to, to take action. Um, in terms of why we've started to look at financialization, our own history is we start to work had so where they would buy up distressed bonds and anyone who remembers anything about our own financial crisis will remember some of these buzzwords that were going on time they basically bought up discounted debt um and then put a lot of pressure on countries to deliver so if you're interested in finding out more we did a report on that situation in Argentina on our website and then in 2016 we did a report looking at the links between the role of these in the global south and their new role at the time in the housing market in ireland um but since then, this role in, in Ireland has just grown and grown and grown. It's become much more of a issue. There have been some really interesting things happening at European level with regard to the, the vulture funds, particularly in sovereign debt, um, particularly one in Belgium. We had a, an interesting event on that a few years ago. But there's been a lot of talk about things we can do um, in Ireland, about things we can do internationally, and not a huge amount of movement recently um, and I think Keith you're probably not as up to date on the situation in Ireland but we're facing a really substantial housing crisis at the moment we have been for years the this sort of aftermath of Covid has just been to see house, house prices go even higher due to such limited demand and it's a really substantial issue um, and so for us I think particularly the role of financialization in all of this the role of the international financial markets and the placement of this issue as is a much bigger trend that we see including our attitudes to tax in this country um, our attitudes to financial regulation 
it's one that isn't often put central in the debate as, as we'd like. And it's one of the issues that people maybe don't feel as confident talking about. And when we run sessions with people, they say they'd like to know more about it. We did a little poll a while ago to see what people wanted to find out the most. And, and this was one of the, the main issues. So basically, so skipping ahead wildly there, um, not to go anywhere for this. Um, this is this is essentially what we wanted to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to try and find the button that will let me stop sharing this somewhere. Um, and here we go. Um, and now we're going to go over to um, the rest of our speakers. So. Rory Hearn is a lecturer in social policy in the Department of Applied Social Studies in the News. Um, he's researched and published in academic and policy in the fields of housing, social housing, housing rights and economic um, inequality for many years. He has a G in geography and he's a very frequent commentator on issues of housing in the Irish media. He published his book, um, Housing Shock in 2020, and we're really excited to have him here with us this evening to sort of talk about some of these issues. So I'll start by hand over to Rory. Thanks Maeve and uh, thanks for the introduction and for the invite for being here this evening. Excuse uh, the background noise if it's there, but uh, unfortunately children are being minded at the same time. Uh, well, they're being minded by the TV, I'm trying to do this. Um, just in terms of, I suppose, starting, um, you know, just to um, commend the work that you have done that is, you know, bringing the issue of financialization to the fore and, you know, the work you've done with Mick Byrne and others, it's been very important, um, you know, in terms of going back to 2016, um, when a lot of this was, was really kind of emerging here. Um, and I suppose what I want to talk about today is where kind of financialization in Ireland came from, how did it evolve, um, and where are we at with it. And in terms of financialization, I suppose from my perspective, and I would um, come at this from, I suppose, both a kind of critical social policy uh, lens and a lens of social justice, um, it's, one, it's one that views financialization as a process by which big financial actors who are interested in um, property as a speculative investment, a short term um, or a long term, but essentially it's a speculative asset, it's a commodity for them. And so that's where I would put kind of the role of what we call global real estate funds, private equity funds, their increased role in housing and alongside or in residential property as it's called alongside the conversion of property into an investment asset now that's all process of financialization as i see it um, and obviously there's different there's different views on it but in terms of, i suppose i just i have some slides um and i won't um uh do death by slide but um here we go now to share so um, let's see. Try that one second now. It's not actually doing a slideshow. I know it's doing one second. No, are we more in business now? Okay, so um, I cover this in my book, Housing Shock, which came out last year um, and published by Policy Press. Unfortunately, I don't make much money from it, if any. Uh, it's an academic, largely academic book, but I've tried to write it in a way that would be accessible to people, the general public who mightn't um, have an academic background. But a large part within that book, I set out how financialization unfolds in Ireland and describe, I suppose, how the way housing as a commodity has become central to 
capitalism really over the last 30 years. And largely that has been implemented through neoliberalism, which is that kind of withdrawal of the state from uh, directly building, providing social housing, the handing it over to the market, um, and in particular then the increased role of financial actors in providing social housing and housing in general. Um, so what I describe is that there have been three waves of financialization in Ireland, that the first wave was the ex uh, extension of debt, lending, mortgage lending, um, from the 1990s into 2008. And an important part of that was the extension of the buy to let uh, lending, which was essentially mortgage lending that was being lent to people who are buying uh, uh, property as an investment to rent out. And if we see, because there's a lot of talk about now global investors and the way in which they're buying up property and can do it, developing the bill to rent. But in many ways, there was a form of that taking place in the late 1990s and into the 2000s by which we had the expansion of investor landlords, but they were individuals and obviously they are different, but nonetheless, it was converting housing into an investment asset. And we, we've seen the legacy of that into the current crisis now. What I described then is the second wave of financialization is when the global real estate and vulture funds came in to buy up distressed loans and properties off the banks and off NAMA. And they were obviously invited in and um, by the Irish state actively encouraged. And then what I describe as a third wave, whereby we see that institutional investors have increasingly delivered what we call um, private rental, the bill to rent sector. Now, both bought, purchased um, to rent, but also then increasingly bill to rent. And this shift from financialization being essentially an expansion in mortgage credit to an expansion of investment funds, essentially buying up or building and providing rental housing to generation rent. And what I call the conversion of generation rent into a essential global a commodity for these global funds. So the question is, how did financialization happen? It didn't happen by accident. Um, it happened by active promotion by our state. Our government um, since 2008, and in particularly the new Fine Gael-led government from 2011 and 12 onwards, um, really actively encouraged investment funds and vulture funds to come into Ireland and to buy up these so-called toxic loans off the banks. Um, for example, um, NAMA had sold by 2012, uh, almost 4,000 properties worth 7 billion. Uh, there's a, our Minister for Finance in 2013, who's Michael Noonan, and the chairperson of um, NAMA, who still remains the chairperson, Brenda McDonough, um, sorry, the CEO of NAMA, and saying how NAMA was this really important part of the recovery. Um, and NAMA became a very important symbol for the state that they were achieving recovery from the property market. But of course, what NAMA was actually doing by selling off all these loans and properties and land to investment funds was essentially handing over the housing future um, of generation rent to vulture funds and investor funds. Um, and NAMA continues to play that role in selling off its property and land to vulture funds. They went out and they actively targeted them um, in terms of bringing in these global funds to buy up property and, as I said, toxic loans. But then we see from 2013 onwards that they increasingly became this argument that these investment funds would provide an increased supply of housing. And we see this argument in 2016 in the Rebuilding Ireland, the government's housing plan, that investment funds, real estate investment trusts would provide a, cent provide a central role in supplying housing to rent. And so government very much supporting that. Now, there's lots of different examples of this. For example, the Cherrywood development in South Dublin, uh, the US real estate giant Heinz bought that um, from NAMA uh, portfolio as part of that called the Project Cherry for 270 million. It was the largest development site in South County Dublin, 166 hectares. Um, and now uh, Heinz is currently developing a, um, a suburb there, which is largely built to rent 
apartments, which would be very high end. They also then Hind sold part of that land to US Vulture Fund Lone Star for significant profit and essentially showing how real estate investors buying land um, and property off NAMA, then converting it either into build to rent or selling it on, making significant profits um, at the cost of um, the Irish uh, people and particularly generation rent. We see IRES REIT now our largest landlord. They were essentially supported to be set up by NAMA. NAMA sold them their important portfolios that they developed. Um, and importantly as well, NAMA and this process of financialization was used to what's called reboot the property market. Um, NAMA argued, for example, 25, 15 and 2016, that those investors, the foreign capital, who they were trying to attract in, that they had ideas of returns on their investment of between 15 and 20%, and that these returns would not be met unless market prices rose further. And so NAMA was essentially given the task of trying to drive up house prices and investors were the target for that. And we see my point that our housing system over the last eight years has essentially been reshaped in the interests of these global investment funds, which has had detrimental impacts on housing affordability. We've also seen that these investment funds who have bought up this land off NAMA are now hoarding it. So they're in no impetus to develop it. It has been simply used and speculated um, with no development taking place. Kennedy Wilson is another uh, real estate investor who have, and these investors have only come in since 2013, 2014, so a very recent entry. Um, this whole idea of uh, these uh, vulture fund, investor fund, corporate landlords. And they're now Ireland's second largest landlord, uh, landlord private rental landlord. And one of their developments in Clancy Key has been criticized for some of it remaining vacant for over two years at the midst of a housing crisis and um, being argued that they're not getting the rents they want to get and therefore they're leaving it vacant until they get those rents. Um, so I, I have lots of uh, slides here I can, you know, people can look at um, in terms of what's happening. And I suppose the important point is that, we'll go on here, um, in terms of the current crisis or current sort of controversy over it, is that the government is very supportive of real estate investment trust and investor funds. Um, they've made the argument for it. Their recent measures are largely ineffectual in terms of trying to address it. But I think there has been a massive public outcry. There has been a massive public outcry over the investment funds buying the, um, buying the housing. And I think that we've reached a turning point in the crisis in that the Irish, sort of particularly generation rent or generation stuck at home have, have reached their, they were no longer willing to accept this situation whereby investor funds are buying up their homes, are pushing up prices and government is acting in the interests of the investor funds rather than affordable housing. And so I think the political situation is developing um, significantly. And we're seeing, we're seeing that, for example, this is a, what work that Dara Turnbull has done showing the increase in the role of investors in buying housing here. And we can see this significant rise from 2013 onwards. And that's of course, when the Real Estate Investment Trust tax break was introduced into 2016 and onwards, where at a point in 2019, uh, 2020, should I say, there was more properties bought by people who are buying it as an investment and those who are living in it. Now, it's important to say within these figures, the state is also there. So the state is probably buying at least a third of those units for social housing. But again, the argument being similar with the investors, they're both adding to house price pressures. And I believe that that is why we're seeing this significant rise in house prices. So just to finish up, um, I wanted to share with you two things. Uh, firstly, is the if you want to find out more on this, you can um, check out the the podcast that I do, um, which is called Reboot Republic, 
And I just did a recent episode um, with Mick Byrne on the whole question of financialization and are we seeing a change? Because I think this is the big question. With COVID opening up the kind of re-emergence of the state as a key actor, the question is, are we seeing the end point of neoliberalism and the re-emergence of the state being a major provider and funder because it can borrow and this encouragement of it to borrow to build social and affordable housing? And can that be a real challenge to financialization? Because of course, the real reason financialization happens is because you don't have affordable housing as the competitor to the financial actors. Um, and then the final thing is just in terms of um, what you can do, um, the, let me put it there now, one second, sorry. Um, that I have been developing with um, the campaign Uplift, a petition, there it is, where against to call on the government to stop um, buying, the investors buying our homes, um, and you can sign that petition, it's there. And the key call within that is to scrap the investor tax breaks that these REITs have, to put a tax on profits, to restrict the sale of developments, um, and to build public affordable homes and to have the right to housing in a constitution, which I think is really key. So I know I've gone over my time, apologies for that, uh, and apology for the interjections, but I'll, I'll leave it there and look forward to hearing uh, the rest now, and you look forward to your questions now as well. Thanks so much, Rory. I see um, one question's popped in already, but what I'm going to suggest is if we hear from Keith first and then take all the questions together, because I think you're um, you're going to build on each other and provide more food for thought. So I think it's it's good if we do it that way. Um, so then I think, um, thank you so much. I've, I've, I've been jotting down a few things I want to ask questions about later. So uh, looking forward to that. But um, I'll, I'll just quickly introduce um, our next speaker, Keith Stad, and then hand over to, to you. So Keith is an active member of the Dutch Union for Precarious Housing um, and has participated in the squatting movement in Amsterdam since the early 1980s. From 2018 to 2020, he coordinated a project on housing and financialization in the Netherlands that aimed to have large participation for activities for International Housing Action Day. Um, he coordinates the website globalinfo.nl, which offers background information on globalization, trade and related issues in the Netherlands since 2002, and has been very involved in movement to protect um, organic farms from being destroyed for supermarket chains. So he has a lot to say on um, financialization and housing from a global perspective. And Keith, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Um, I'll hand over to you now um, and let me know um, when you want me to share that video for you as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um... Yeah, I'm I'm based in in Amsterdam, um, and when I started living here, uh, it was early '80s. I came here to study, but in reality, I came to also to join a very lively squatting movement that existed in in that uh, time, and that almost succeeded in in um, making a, an end to speculation with housing in in that uh, in that period. Um, even even the mayor and, and political parties agreed that uh, the influence of the squatting movement was very beneficial for housing prices and uh, rent, uh, the, the level of, of rent and the affordability of, of houses. Uh, and since then, the world went upside down in a way. If you look at it now uh, in, in the Netherlands uh, and certainly in Amsterdam and other uh, large cities, the prices of uh, house, uh, housing have been going so high that people spend often more than half of their income on, on housing costs and, and the poorer people are, the more that they, they spend and sometimes you need two jobs to, to, to be able to uh, afford the rent if you, um, if you get a house at all. So something happened in that period between the 80s and now, and everybody knows, of course, it's a new liberalism and up, uh, how do you call it? Uh, my English is not always um, um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the level needed to explain these difficult uh, things, but uh, financialization came in fact as a 
as a wanted uh, effect uh, within neoliberalism uh, to make the extraction of, of value possible in markets that previously were not accessible. Uh, and with housing, you could see that very, very clearly because uh, in 2008, you had this big subprime crisis that started with, uh, with uh, a crisis of, uh, of mortgages in the United States, but then spread all over the world and had much to do with the market in, in, in housing. Um, and I think the, the situation that we have now and the rates in Ireland are directly connected to that crisis, to that shock when the housing market collapsed and everything changed there. It created this market in also in, in rental um, uh, housing that did in fact did not exist be, be, before because and this is the other uh, um, um, ph phenomena that happened. It, it's called securitization. It means that you can you can bring together packages of um, of, of uh, assets that can be uh, sold on on the market, bought and and sold again. Um, so for international uh, hedge funds and vulture funds, one dwelling in uh, a neighborhood in in Amsterdam or in Dublin or wherever is not is not very interesting they would never spend time on buying that up but with intermediaries they can make packages of uh, of thousands of them and uh, extract the rent and the other value that is in these packages uh, for their shareholders or for themselves if they are not um, publicly um, and and that is that is something new i think um, it started in 2011 and um, and grew since then and now it's it's a, a global phenomenon it's everywhere um, uh, and for instance in uh, a big uh, housing owner as a blackstone is uh, has property in in 60 countries um, and the the people in barcelona they made a, a, a small film to 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 make this um, to try to make uh, the owners of Blackstone understand what they, what they were doing. I don't know uh, if, if what the effect of it was, but I think the effect was, especially for people that had to live in the houses that Blackstone was buying up, that they felt a connection uh, between them because it's people in Barcelona speaking very, uh, well, you could say bad English addressing, you know, these people in New York that own their, their housing now. Maybe we can take a look at this video. Yep, so I'm just going to, is that now? One second. This is a message to Blackstone from Spain. From the tenants of your new houses. Houses that used to be our homes, maybe. You don't know us. But you will. Yes, you will. We are the part. La plataforma afectada por la hipoteca. The Spanish platform against evictions. And we fight for the right to house. The Spanish. Government and the rescue the Spanish banks are selling our houses to you with huge, huge discounts. Discounts that were denied to us. And now you are raising the prices, putting all of us in risk of eviction. Maybe you think you are untouchable hiding in your nice building in Manhattan, but you are not. You don't know what we are capable of. This is what we do to people like you. <laughs> And this is what you do to people like us. <laughs> you listen carefully, Blackstone. We will fight for our homes, for our rights, for our dignity, for our sons and daughters and grandchildren. We will fight against your economic interests, against everything you represent. We will make sure that everybody knows who you are and what you do. Get ready. We are.
uh, yeah, uh, uh, you can w w watch the video uh, uh, on uh, on internet. Of course, it it runs better than this this version did. I think because on Zoom it uh, it's difficult to uh, to have it go uh, fluidly. But um, yeah, I think um, the what happened in Barcelona is part of the answer uh, of what you could organize to try to counter these uh, um, anonymous. Uh, powers taking over the housing market, but at the same, uh, as as you might know, in Barcelona they had a, a very progressive, uh, like a kind of a um, uh, ad hoc uh, political party or coming together of political parties that won the elections, and then Ada Colau, who who was uh, the spokesperson for this uh, plataforma de los afectados de hipoteca, this PA, she became mayor. So you would say this is like the best position you can have to, to, uh, to try to, to change the situation. But uh, at the same time, you could see how limited the possibilities for local governments were to, to do that. And she had to even allow lots of evictions to happen. And um, well, yeah, it, it, it was an experiment that shows uh, on the one side what tools there are available. If, if local governments say they can't do anything uh, against uh, the fact that uh, vulture funds are buying up your your house, uh, there are. Uh, we could talk about it uh, uh, later, maybe. And I think in Ireland, I don't know if the situation is very different uh, because national laws, of course, always uh, are, are different and what they allow uh, and what not. Um, but at the same time, it also shows the limits of, uh, and it, this is because, for instance, uh, on the European level, all kind of uh, regulation and laws have also uh, been put in in working that, um, for instance, in the Dutch situation, make it impossible for uh, governments to still act in the interest of uh, public housing. It's very limited. You can only subsidize uh, public housing for a specific very limited uh, group of people um, that have very low income and not anymore for um, people with, a, with, with regular uh, incomes. Uh, and this is a, is a big uh, a change. And this was set, of course, uh, with, uh, with the idea of creating this market for private uh, capital. Um, and uh, in the Netherlands, we have a system with uh, housing associations. This has been existing for more than a hundred years. These are like private partner, uh, public uh, partnerships where the state uh, subsidizes these associations to build and uh, rent out uh, uh, social housing. And they more and more they have started to act as a as a financialized uh, enterprise themselves and be and selling their property to try to make money to build new houses and um, it, they have become uh, part of the problem. Uh, so these forces are very real and make it very uh, difficult to find solutions if you are um, if you are simple unorganized. Uh, person living in one of the houses that is being sold by by such an association. Um, and I think there's many examples of, of what to do and the best is maybe in uh, Germany at the moment, uh, especially in Berlin. Um, there you had a progressive government, local government also, they tried to uh, install a rent cap and they did. And then the the, the lobby for the real estate uh, investors and house owners uh, went to court and they won. So the rent cap has been canceled now. And the uh, housing movement uh, had foreseen that they said it, it will not work. It's just a temporary solution that's not even allowed. And we want the referendum. They have proposed a referendum uh, where if they win, um, the companies, housing companies that own more than 3,000 units will be, um, um, how do you call it, uh, nationalized or socialized. Uh, because there's also a big debate about how, what to do then and how, how to not bring it back into this like big bureaucratic state uh, entities that, that were there before. Uh, but somehow make new kinds of uh, ways to 
so that people that live in the houses have something to say about the costs and about how they are maintained and all these uh, all the decisions that are being taken um, around these houses. And um, yeah, we can we can talk about other um, examples of uh, of um, successful movements. Um, and um, yeah, in the global south, of course, it is much harder. The, the, the fight, uh, it's much more about uh, taking over land and building own uh, houses where you will see that the, the same uh, funds that buy up houses are buying up land now also. So in, in a way, you are finding the, the, the same enemy in the urban uh, surroundings and in the, in the rural. Um, but um, I wanted to to finish with uh, making a, a, a plain, uh, how do you call it, advertisement for a really great book, uh, Urban Warfare, and it's uh, written by uh, Raquel Rolnik. And she used to be the UN um, um, representative for the right to housing. And she did her work very uh, serious. And she went to all these places where housing crises were happening and where people were fighting. And she wrote a book about it. and. Um, in her afterward, she also uh, tries to 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 see some positive uh, um, developments. Um, and I'll, I'll just quote the last uh, Alinea. For now, it suffices to know that in the June journeys in Brazil, in uprisings against the evictions caused by mega events in Cape Town, Tokyo, or Rio de Janeiro, in the platform for people affected by mortgages in Spain in demonstrations against gentrification in the global north and south, urban struggles are in the ascendant. The Lefebrian concept of the right to the city is definitely alive and kicking in the streets. Uh, so she has, uh, and she knows, uh, she's, she's been to all these uh, places. Uh, she has a good hope. This was written in 2017, I think, um, that some, um experiences now are bearing fruit to to roll back in fact this financialization and and this taking over of uh, housing by corporations that only want to make money out of it and the whole idea of that houses are um for people and not for profit uh is is getting is growing and getting um steam and for people in Europe, maybe there is, uh, for instance, there is uh, an international network of groups called the European Action Coalition for the Right to Housing. Um, and uh, it's useful to like n uh, get to know them and their work, and they do research also and have gatherings. And uh, every year there is an um, international day of action uh, last year, of course, it was uh, completely torpedoed by uh, the the Corona uh, pandemia. But um, we are hoping to pick up that again, and um, and and I think it's very much like uh, Raquel Rolnik also says. There's no model at this moment. There's not one um uh, way to like solve this but you have to to find all kind of uh, local struggles and uh, get um uh inspiration uh fr from there and then um there is a, a way out <laughs> thank you so much Gies. um i'm just gonna pop in the chat box actually um the name of the book, someone's asking. Um, and for those of you who are interested, we actually run a, um, a book club. Um, so I might add that to, we, we've chosen the next one, um, but uh, for the one after, I think, I think people would really enjoy that. So um, we'll pop that on. Um, thank you so much to you both. I have a sneaky list of questions, but I'll try not to abuse my position. So maybe I'll start. I see there's a couple of, um, of Q and A's popping up. Um, and what I might do now is, um, I 
might just see if I can give everyone the permission. Um, honestly, this could really go to your head um, of, of speaking just to see if anyone who has either asked a question or put one in the chat box, if you'd like to ask um, a question of the panelists now, I'm just trying to, um, yeah, from give give everyone that that's literally how it shows up for me. Allowed to talk. Um, so I'll pop that here. Um, and there's a question. The book club isn't specifically on financialization or housing. It's actually generally our economic justice book club. So um, we've read. I'm just thinking of like recent ones. So the last book. I feel like it should be around me. Um, oh, this isn't the last book. This is from a while ago. This is a book on money and the history and the origin of money. We read a while ago. Um, our most we've we've read books on um we've read books on debt um we've read books on um uh, the last one's called the bank job it was about a, a a kind of art project people did to show the power of the banks where they bought student debt and um, wrote it off and housing debt um, cheap on the money markets, which is which the people who were in debt couldn't do themselves, um, that they funded through an art project and they um, basically sent people letters saying we've written off your debt and they did kind of an explosion of the debt in the financial services sector in London, um, presumably following a lot of health and safety guidance, you would hope. Um, but uh, so, so quite a wide range. We read fiction at various points. Um, I'll be putting up actually all the books we've read to date on our website as part of our website refurb if um, if you're interested, but I'll definitely make sure we, we do do that one. Um, and yeah, we, we tweet out about it and stuff like that. So if you just you don't have to come to all of it just whichever random one is there so okay we have added everyone with the ability to speak um so yeah does anyone want to i mean maybe raise your hand and ask a question or are we gonna wait a little bit or maybe i might um I might start off if people want to to take a moment and, and think about it um just to ask so I've, I have a couple of questions that probably go, go to to both of you um one so Keith the the kind of what, what you've just said in the video from Blackstone I've seen it before it's really really powerful I'm not sure how how good it came across with the internet I, I could see it fine but that might have worked for everyone but um when when I first saw that around the time we, we first published a report on this, it was soon enough after all the funds were coming into Ireland and it was at a time when our experience was very much rooted in their role in the global south with sovereign debt bonds and we were looking at what they'd done overseas and at that point what they'd done was essentially come in, do evictions, flip the properties very quickly and move on and we haven't seen that in the same way here we've seen them extracting huge rents um we haven't seen the same levels of evictions and i'm curious um i mean maybe maybe the specifics on this is, is from rory and then maybe with pieces if, if this is played out similarly elsewhere that you're aware of but i've always wondered if it's to do with our laws or if it's to do with the fact that they're just making such astonishing profits here that they don't actually need to kind of extract the money and move on. That they're they're in it for a longer haul um, because now I know that I'm, I'm sort of merging lots of different. Some of the funds always take a long term view. Some of them are much more extractive in nature, but we haven't seen the same kind of approach that you see in other places. And then sort of tagged onto that in my mind, they're they're the same kind of thing. Um, the comment about what we can do in terms of the regulation and what we can, how we can put, um, curtail what they're doing is, is CETA and the ratification of CETA likely to be an issue with this, or do you have any thoughts on that? So they're my my questions to start with. Do you want to go first, Keys? Um, I didn't understand the last. C C what? Oh, I'm sorry. So CETA the the um. Canadian European oh, trade okay. agreement. CETA, so yeah. in Ireland it's going to be our first um yeah, it's gonna be our first bilateral. Um we 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 haven't been part of any investor state dispute um mechanisms before. So it's actually there's a constitutional challenge going on about it. Um but it would open us up potentially to things that we haven't been opened up to before. So I'm curious about the potential impact of that. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't know how the local laws are on um, on how you can treat your uh, real estate ownership in in Ireland and whether it differs much from uh, from the the Spanish situation or, or other places where Blackstone has been investing. I know in the Dutch situation um, that they always have this as an argument, like it doesn't matter who owns it because the rules stay the same. That the the protection for renters and these kind of uh, uh, regulations and, and laws uh, st stay the same. So whether you're uh, being bought up by a, a hedge fund or, or your neighbor is the owner, they have the same uh, situation. And that, that's, of course, it's an um, ideological answer that is uh, completely besides uh, the, the, the truth. Uh, th there are large effects of this uh, uh, financialization and the scale that these these uh, funds can can operate makes them... Uh, uh, a very different house owner than someone who, who owns uh, only only a few of them. Um, there, there are many effects. Uh, also, the shareholder value that is being extracted from from the from the estate is uh, is something to be to be uh, aware of. In, in um, we saw calculations about Fonovia in uh, Germany. Where it appeared that almost a quarter of the of the revenues were were siphoned off uh, to a shareholder. So this means this is money disappearing that used to be available for maintenance or lowering the rents or whatever, and now it uh, it it is being extracted. Um, so, but for the uh, we, we also saw that uh, public housing was being bought. We, we had one of those housing associations that almost went broke because they had been um, speculating with uh, money with this Iceland bank uh, when the when in 2008 the the crisis uh, happened and they they lost their money in in a way um, and they had to sell off more than 10,000 of their houses and it was sold to a Swedish uh, investment company. Um, who has already resold them uh, to Blackstone, I think it, it was, because they had made their profit. Of uh, the, the, They wait for the house prices to, to um, increase the value of the, of the assets. And when that is achieved, if that is in, in half a year, then they, will, they can sell it off. Uh, and if it takes ten years, then uh, then they wait uh, that period to. So there there is also some kind of a internal uh, market logic about how they operate and uh, and and not. But the the local laws will certainly have much uh, influence on um, on whether they find the 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 local situation interesting to. Uh, invest or not, but uh, Rory will know that better, I think. Yeah, I think this, um, it's it's a really interesting question. And I think that in some ways, it just hasn't been documented that the extent of turnover, when I was doing research for my book, um, I did find quite a number of examples where properties, like for example, I mentioned that hindsight in Cherrywood in South Dublin, where Heinz bought it, then sold it to Lone Star um, and clearly made a profit because the land prices had risen in that intervening period. So there are examples of um, that flipping going on, that speculative, you know, the initial purchase and then sale. What's interesting is that Blackstone is not in Ireland residentially, that it did buy up offices, but it hasn't bought um, residential units, but lots of other investment funds have particularly, as I said, Kennedy Wilson. Kennedy Wilson is the big one here in Ireland that kind of came from internationally. And as Maeve said, Maeve's right, a lot of them bought here um, and have rented out the units. And I think in part that is because we do have laws and laws were put in place to protect mortgage holders from being evicted. Now, what has happened is that I think as well that it meant that Vulture funds couldn't come in here and just evict people who, who own their homes easily. So that was difficult. But so we have seen the purchase by, they're called like Pepper and these international um, debt collection firms have bought quite a lot of um, mortgages. And now we'll see that the mortgages that are in arrears 
are owned by these funds. Um, they're, they're not like the Blackstones, but they're a type of an international real estate, but they're like debt collectors. They're in, in real estate debt collectors. And they, have, they haven't they have evicted people, but what they've done is they've made it very difficult. People have handed over their keys to them, or they're just forcing them to basically pay their mortgage until they die, and then they'll take the property back. So they're taking quite a longer term, but it's still extraction. And that is in part because of those laws. But if you look at the private, at the private rental sector, what you do see is you're right, May, very quickly, these investment funds came in and they bought the units and then rented them out. And because rents were rising so much through 2015, 16, 17 onwards, they clearly saw this was a, you know, this is a real return. And I think um, Keese's point on, you know, a quarter of the revenue being returned to shareholders I don't have the figure in Ireland, but I would say in Ireland, it could be closer to 50%, 60%, even higher, that there is a massive extraction, but we don't, no one really counts that properly. And I think it's a really good area that we could look at because the idea that you would not extract it for shareholders, but that you would reinvest it back in maintaining property, delivering new affordable property just doesn't exist here. It's like, extract the money for the shareholders that's what the real estate investment trusts are set up for and to reinvest in building more expensive property so i think those questions still have to be answered as to how vulture funds but i you know corporate landlords equity funds are extracting wealth from ireland but i think you're right the biggest way they're extracting it from is rents and this idea as well of you know turning over tenants so there has been a lot of evictions of tenants lower paying tenants getting in higher paying tenants. And we know that, you know, we've had this massive family homelessness crisis here over the last five years. And I've just been doing some research around that, trying to link that increase in family homelessness to the way in which investment funds have evicted tenants um, to, and they largely evict tenants who are families to get in higher paying ones. So I think you can see that link there around that, but I think we need to find out more. Thank you. Now I see that we have three hands up. So I think in the in the order, I noticed them. Um, maybe if I can take questions from Tony and then Tom and then Finn. And if you're comfortable to put your video on when you speak, but you don't have to. Thanks. So Tony, I don't, let me just actually check that I've definitely, um, I don't know what's happened. Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, I can now. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I, I just, I'd love, love to hear a comment from both our speakers on the, the MICA situation, which is basically in Donegal and uh, Mayo down the West coast, but I'm actually viewing it as a national um, issue. Uh, a trauma uh, in that we have uh, a minimum of at least a thousand to five thousand houses impacted which are going to have to be destroyed uh, and the rehousing of all of those families uh, the fact that they still are paying their mortgages and are uh, having to leave their homes is a national disgrace and I, I just I just love a comment on it. I live in Donegal, obviously, and my neighbours are terrified of the day they have to leave their house and still pay their mortgage. Thanks, Tony. And I'll just very briefly for Keith, in case he doesn't know, my, Mike is a mineral that's present in some cement and essentially a certain number of houses, well, one to five thousand that we're aware of were built with this um, and it's become apparent that the percentage of it in the building bricks means they're completely unstable. The houses are going to have to be knocked and rebuilt and there's a big pressure on a government redress scheme. The original investors and builders are either out of business or I think kind of we we they've gone to ground whatever um the 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 sort of actual thing is but they certainly don't seem to be volunteering to to pay for it themselves um but i'll, I'll come back i'll take two more questions and then we'll we'll go back to to that question um because i think it, it's interesting actually from a general even besides the specific thing that question of the state 
always being the one who steps in when these buildings go wrong because it's not just Micah so we've, we've seen a number of things here where building regulations weren't weren't followed um so Tom Tom O'Connor do you want to go go next <laughs> thanks Maeve uh, I don't know if I can put on my uh no I can't put on my camera um the uh, just uh, two things one the seat and, and uplift uh, campaign uh, as regards seat i'm actually a member of the, the call of uh, trade justice group and we've been uh, agitating about uh, CETA. and i think the, the answer there is that uh, any um, vulture fund such as blackstone and i hear what rory says that they're, they're not involved in, in housing as such but any vulture fund uh, even if they're not canadian all they have to do is open a letterbox company in canada uh, and then if the Irish government was to, to try to bring in, say, a rent cap or something like that, rather like happened in Berlin, they could use the, the CETA um, ISDS um, system, or ICS as the, the government likes to call it now, uh, to, to sue the Irish government. Uh, now, so far, the CETA hasn't been um, uh, confirmed in, I think, 17 of the EU countries, and it's important that Ireland doesn't uh, pass it here, for example, for that reason. The second thing on ISDS is uh, uh, maybe you're, you're wrong to say that Ireland is not involved in ISDS. In fact, very, very few people know that we are actually signed up to an ISDS and that's the Energy Charter Treaty. Uh, and it is surprising that Ireland hasn't been sued yet because a lot of the uh, fossil fuel companies are uh, involved in suing the states using that. But to come back to housing, uh, Rory, I thought your presentation was excellent. However, I'd have to criticise the, uh, the, the, the petition, not the petition itself, namely, but I went on um, uh, Uplift to have a look and I went into the housing listing and I see there's 16 pages of approximately 12 campaigns each. So I reckon that's about 200 housing uh, petitions. I'm not sure that that is going to, to go terribly far. Uh, and I, I think it would be, uh, I, I just want to let people know that they, as I understand it, uh, some of the organisations are planning uh, protests uh, come the autumn, raise the roof and uh, housing, the Homeless and Housing Coalition, as far as I know now, uh, I'm not a member of either, uh, are actually planning uh, for protests and hopefully COVID will allow us actually to get out on the street uh, more. There has been a few, but uh, we'd be more comfortable in protesting and I just think that those type of actions would be better. Um, I don't know if there's a, any of the Irish organisations are signed up to the European Action Coalition for the Right to Housing but that uh, I'd love to know more from Keith about the International Day uh, every year. Is it the same day right across several European countries and if so it'd be great if some Irish uh, uh, activist group were to sign up and to organise for that day as well. I know that COVID has put a stop to it in the past 18 months or thereabouts. Okay. Thanks, Tom. And Finn, I'll go over to you as well. Uh, thank you very much to our speakers uh, for their presentation. So my question relates to the International Financial Services Centre in Dublin. I'm wondering whether as a financial exclave that's quite a key node in the Irish financial sector, has any research been done on its function as a securitization hub in accelerating the housing crisis by virtue of um, providing facilities to um, asset management firms and such. So I'd be interested to hear, has any work been done on any connection between the IFSC and assets tied to real estate? Thanks, Finn. So um, I'll hand over to the panelists for those three questions, um, if you're able to to jump in. Yeah, I don't mind jumping in. Um, I think that on the, the first question, um, uh, sorry, the, the last one in relation to the financial services sector, I think that's a very good question. I think that there, it's, we know that the setting up, for example, of the real estate investment trust tax break, and the which set up the real estate investment trust structure, you know that that would have obviously been advised by tax advisors who work in the IFSC and that system, um, and we know that there is massive funds held in global real estate in 
the uh, domiciled here, you know, in the IFSC, and a large part, or not a large part, but I think it's uh, the figure I saw at the weekend, I think about 40% of those funds have property here in Ireland. And there's a whole load of mechanisms like the, there's the different fund structures that have been set up by which you're right, these properties that are held are packaged into, put together into funds that are then um, held and as you say, securitized as well. So there is no doubt that our tax system, our tax structures, our vehicles that have been set up here and our system based from the IFSC is absolutely facilitating both the financialization of housing here and internationally. Um, I think that in relation to CETA, I think, yes, it is a reasonable point to make that CETA potentially could uh, be a real problem if we wanted to put in place um, rent caps on investment funds or even change our rental laws. Um, if these funds held, were able to take the government to an investor dispute mechanism, I think that's very worrying. Um, and then in terms of the MICA, I think that the MICA crisis is one that shows up the problem with just handing building over to the market um, and the lack of regulation of building um, and also people have been just left deal with housing by themselves. Um, and I think we are likely to see big protests um, and there should be protests over housing when it's safe um, in terms of COVID. Thanks, Rory. Um, Keith, is there anything you want to, to contribute on those? Uh, yeah, just about this International Housing Action Day that is indeed uh, an international where all, all movements uh, in Europe and even uh, yeah, Turkey is, uh, on the edge of Europe, you, you could say, uh, had joined. Um, it used to be uh, end of uh, March. And the reason was that in uh, France, they, they called it in France because you always, in the winter, you have a, um, it's it's forbidden to, to evict people because of the cold. So homeless people can squat in the winter and cannot be evicted. But there's always like a, a certain day after which the, the ban on eviction it doesn't uh, apply anymore. And it, exactly that day was was uh, announced then as an international day of action. And then the Germans uh, did a demonstration with 25,000 people in Berlin on the first time that they uh, joined. It was a big surprise for them too. Um, and so then we decided to let's try to uh, to spread it out. And um, so it's uh, it it was supposed to be on the 27th of March of last year, but then we, we couldn't do anything. I put a link to it uh, uh, for the la last time in the in the chat. Uh, and about this mica situation, it reminds me a lot of uh, in Germany. There was also a building that the the tenants had to evict, uh, had to evacuate because it was collapsing or it was threatening to collapse, and uh, they couldn't find who the owner was. They, they, because of course they had, they made lots of costs. They had to, had to find uh, hotels and, and stuff like that to, to, uh, for, for their, for, for the first few days. And then after that, of course, they, they would do, to have, uh, other homes, uh, and the house owner was not, uh, they, they couldn't find it because it was such a difficult construction involving, I think it was Russian speculative money invested via Malta letterbox companies and whatever that they lost, nobody could find anymore who was responsible for the, for the, for the building. And it is indeed a very a strong argument for not allowing this kind of uh, incredible, uh, complicated, complex owner structures and local law should provide in that to, to prohibit it. it. It's a good argument for it. Of course, the people living in it now uh, are not helped, but they will be helped by solidarity and protests and uh, uh, against uh, or demanding to be protected by the state in, in that case. Um, yeah. And uh, about IACS, I, I just read a report from Corporate Europe Observatory about new lobby initiatives by business in Europe to because uh, they are not able to use this kind of structures uh, for intra-European investments. And they want to set up a court, 
uh, like a business court for themselves. So they're trying to set up like a European ISDS. This is, at this moment, it is very topical and it would be good for people to um, put that on their agenda and to uh, to 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 counter that 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 uh, lobby because otherwise I, I mean if you're being bought up by Vonovia uh, which is a German uh, um, house owner uh, corporation um, it's, it's of course not much better than uh, Blackstone or or anything um, yeah. Sorry to be blabbering. Thanks, and just want to say thank you to um, Rory. He's just said he's he's going to have to leave a little early. So um, thank you so much for everything. We'll we'll keep on going for a little bit. I've just found some questions that were a bit missing there. So so I might just throw um, throw a few out there. So um, a question about sort of shared equity schemes. And whether it will drive the price of housing upwards. So this is something Keith that um, the government is pushing as an alternative um, and sort of a general question about is it political ineptitude or corruption or a mixture of both. Um, it's a funny one on on the the shared equity scheme. I, I used to live in London and I knew a few people who were um, sort of caught up in that and it's it's an odd one. They, they have a shared equity scheme that I, I knew people who were horrendously affected by it. They were kind of trapped in situations they couldn't easily get out of without um, losing a lot. And other people who it was essentially a way to help them benefit from a rising tide. So it, it didn't in that context, it certainly didn't do anything like it we're being told it's going to do. It, it, it like you said, it, it drove a rush of, of prices up um, and it helped some. And then in areas where the price prices didn't go up people got quite stuck because there's quite onerous um conditions attached to it but i don't know if that's kind of the case everywhere i don't know keith if, if there's anywhere um you're aware of these these shared equity schemes in the rest of europe it's it's something i've only heard of personally in in the uk but i'm sure they must be other places as well no i i have no experience uh, on that uh, ground so I, I don't know no Maybe someone else here in the in the group. Yeah. Does, does anyone else um, come across them anywhere? Any views? I guess that's a no. Um, it's it's an interesting one, and I guess the the comment about kind of um, political ineptitude and all of that. I th I think what's what's interesting about our um, our political scenario, I think, is just how much these, um, I don't know, th these things are, are like a political perspective, I suppose. I think I think the, the view, the belief in, like you said, it's rooted in a belief of neoliberalism, rooted, rooted in a belief of, um, a particular form like this has not sort of been incidental certainly in this country we, we have we invited these sort of um trusts in we gave them f favorable tax deals you know we kind of um we've done everything to encourage them to stay so i think it's it's definitely not the case that we can say this has happened you know by accident or or anything this this has been a political policy from from the the ruling parties for for the last decade um so that that's kind of it's an interesting one. I'm actually just before I go back to Keith, I'm just going to pop in the chat box um, an evaluation form if people have a few minutes while we chat now to fill it in. We have to do these for our funders. Um, it also has a, an opportunity for you to tell us what um, what kind of new things you might like us to do. And also briefly, just while I, I have your attention, I also want to flag that on Wednesday we're having an event looking at. Um, whether the COVID crisis has derailed chance for a chance for a kind of fair deal on climate change. We have um, a couple of Irish speakers and a speaker from the Caribbean, um, just about how I guess plans to ensure a just transition may have been derailed in terms of the financial response to COVID. So um, if you're interested in that, it would be great to have you come along. Now maybe two, two events in a couple of days might be too much for you, but uh, maybe it'll be cloudier on Wednesday. Um, but 
yeah, I'll, I'll go back to, to Keith there. And I will also just say we, we will be sharing, I'll share the slides, I'll um, share the book that was referenced and a couple of other things by email to everyone who was registered for the event. So you don't need to worry about that. Uh, yeah, on shared equity, uh, yeah, at, at what what happened in Holland a lot is that uh, people were um, were lured into buying a house even though they couldn't afford it. Uh, so they they would uh, try to to um, um, how do you call it to bring money together to 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 build something um, cooperatively. That that has happened and. Um, we saw that the banking system here was that they would not allow uh, mortgages for collective buildings so everybody had to go get their their individual mortgage for that so it was in fact it was impossible to to arrange that um, collectively uh, the the banking system doesn't like it and um, um, but, but it happens a bit and some of the housing associations participated and then they would impose uh, a clause that you could not just sell your ownership, you had to sell it to them. Uh, so, so it would not become like an asset on the, on, on the market. So, but the scale of it is very limited. Uh, there are a few of these experiences uh, experiments um, of yeah, different ways of uh, ownership. But uh, in the end, I think it will not, um, it will not bring real solutions. And, um, and it, um, it, it will increase the, 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 the prices of, uh, of houses uh, if, if more and more people start doing that. Another reason I heard for many people to buy uh, property was it was a kind of a, like a pension for them. They saw the prices rising, you know, and people are very insecure about uh, their old age and will they have uh, enough money to live uh, then? And by investing in a, in real estate, you could uh, you could secure your pension, which is like also a really weird relation you get then with your neighbors or or your your neighborhood. Um, but it is it is a, a reason uh, for for people to. Uh, Apart from that, there is no other way available. If you want to live in Amsterdam nowadays, uh, you 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 have to try to buy something for ridiculous prices, uh, or you move far away, um, and then your transport prices will be uh, will be very high. Um, yeah, but I'm not telling something something new. I I was wondering uh, if there is a large difference with the Irish situation, considering uh, public and social housing. Whether because the amount of social housing in the Netherlands is still quite high, I think we still have a million houses that fall under that um, uh, category, and um, it's 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 staying more more or less uh, uh, that it's diminishing 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 very little. And what is happening is that it's the character of the um, of the contracts are changing. They work uh, in the social housing sector. They work more and more with temporary contracts. So as a student, you only get a house for as long as you study or for five years or something like, like that. Well, in the past, you, you just get a, a, a fixed contract with all the rights that uh, go along with them. And this is changing very rapidly now. No, I think uh, unfortunately our situation is very, very different. We, we have a huge um, backlog and waiting list for, for social housing. Um, I think the chance of getting one as a student, I imagine, is, is close to zero. Um, you have families who are in hotels as emergency accommodation for years, basically, because there, there isn't suitable um, housing. There aren't even suitable private housing. We have something called the HAP scheme, where basically to offset the shortage in housing, the government is supplementing private rent. So, I mean, effectively paying the mortgages of, of private um, landlords. Um, so the assets remain privately owned, but the state's um, either paying some of or, or all of the rent. Um, so we're we're in a bad way, I think, social housing wise. Um, I see, t Tony, you have your hand up again, I think. So did you want to, to come in? If you did, you're muted, just so you know. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I, I actually didn't want to come in. I'm just, uh, I've, lo I've loved the session, uh, could do more. 
um, the 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 um, all of the things that you've talked about uh, are reflected, you know, outside of uh, the uh, Greater Dublin area. Even up here, uh, speculative uh, building uh, is taking place, and uh, it's also the the notion of that. Uh, I call it fallow fields, fallow land left to increase. That's happening right out in the country where I live. Uh, that's all. Thanks, Tony. And I, I think I think that's right. I think it's kind of it's definitely not. Um, not a Dublin phenomenon and um, I think it's not, not even an, an Ireland um, phenomenon that that might be my my um, my last question for Keith if, if uh, um, no one else wants wants to jump in I, th I think we've, we've got all the questions so far but just um, you, you touched on how in the global south there's um, purchase of of land and things like that but I'm curious so something we we come across in our work in general um, is the extent to which a lot of what's going on globally um, with the financial markets is money looking for a home, money looking for a way to extract income. Um, and, and the global site in general has been targeted in so many ways, you know, kind of through various um, be to do a tax, be to do a certain public-private partnership. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of investment. Um, some of it probably, you know, genuine investment as we we think of, but a lot of it very extractive. And I'm I'm curious um, how you see or if you have any thoughts on on how this will unfold in terms of of housing in um, in that context for a lot of like developing countries. Um, what, what sort of does the future hold? Yeah, I, I'm I'm not very uh, good in um, in 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 how do you call it uh, uh, foretelling the, the the future, but it's not looking uh, very well. Um, and and it also has to do with um, of course the global south being in such a disadvantageous position. For instance, also they have to the if uh, if they have debts of course they have to repay it in in dollars or in or, or in euros uh, often so uh, uh, that's that's already one trap that is so uh, so disadvantageous for for global south countries compared to uh, to us in europe or or the americans uh, and this this you see uh, there there is a, a very big debt crisis uh, on the horizon uh, now of course uh, because of all the covid uh, uh, expenditures that have uh, states have been making um, and it will be uh, not very um, um, how do you call it? The, the, the chances that 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 the money to be spent on creating housing and especially uh, public or social housing in the in the south that it will enhance is not uh, is not is not there, unless you have a government, of course, who refuses to to repay and says we have uh, we have more important uh, things to to invest in. Um, and um, yeah, we were last year. We were in Buenos Aires, and we saw how there was uh, th there was a big like neighborhood in the in the harbor district that had been rich uh, uh, built for speculation. Basically, it was completely empty. It was in the in the center of of Buenos Aires. Uh, tens of thousands of uh, of uh, high uh, end. Um, apartments uh, completely empty there, there were uh, shops there with people sitting it but they said that we had don't have customers because there's nobody living here because it was built purely for speculation it doesn't matter if people use it or pay rent or not the the fact that uh, the the value increases because of uh, of the, the amount of money that is around to invest in these kind of uh, of of enterprises is uh, is is scary, and I, I think we didn't talk about this all. But this whole uh, quantitative easing uh, policies of European um, uh, Union also, and the way central banks um, operate with 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 that money, only throwing it into uh, private um, uh, capital and, and markets and banks um, is is very. Uh, uh, bad for, for that. It means it creates this what they call wall of money that for a large part goes into real estate because that's 
that's the most secure, you know, stones don't walk, walk away. They say they are there if you invest in them. Uh, sometimes something burns down, but but that you, you can ensure that. Um, so it's not like crops in agriculture that can go lost or something like that. It, it's, um, it's such a magnet for this wall of money that has been created that it causes all these... Uh, these enormous, uh, on the one hand, high prices, and on on the other hand, real estate without a function. In, in, instead of buying, uh, building uh, houses for people that need it, they build houses just to make a profit. And I don't see, they, they also don't know a way out of it. There's this new housing bubble has been produced now that, yeah, nobody knows how to, uh, how to unwind that. It's a very dangerous uh, time, I think. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't have a more positive uh, ending. No, I think it's. Uh, I, I was accused, probably fairly, after a session we had last week of uh, being quite depressing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, take of the future. That that was about tax. So um, I, I. I'm not sure housing is is. Uh, is much better but I always think it's it's better to have a clear kind of sense of what the problems are if we're going to start fixing it um there's no po point in being falsely optimistic yeah no the only optimistic thing you there's can a, is... there's a lot to be uh, sorry. Okay. no sorry go ahead no the only optimistic thing you can say is that if the housing market collapses the prices will go down and uh, it would be good to prepare for that uh, as as local governments, for instance, you could you could like retake a lot of a lot, a lot of the lost um, uh, estates that uh, that have been privatized. What's unfortunate, I suppose, in in our context, having seen how that's played out here, is it's hard to response, but. I just what what I do find really encouraging is um, you know you share the network of all the people taking action the fact that we're here having the conversations I think there has been a real um, growth in people's awareness on these issues and in wanting to kind of act on it it's it's kind of the number one political issue in this country at the moment now what that will turn into we'll have to wait and see but you know that that sort of they're all the necessary first steps for change to happen. So I think um, we have to be be grateful, or at least at this point, where people are aware there's a massive problem. Um, we just need to to act about it. But um, we're kind of we're coming to the end of our time. We said we'd finish at half eight. So um, listen, I'll just say thank you so much to to all our participants and to to Keith and Rory. Um, we'll share out. Um, if you get a chance to do the evaluation, that, that will be brilliant. Um, we'll share out the, the slides when Rory shares them. Um, we'll be putting the webinar recording up in a while. Um, and we'll I'll share the link to the, um, the housing action as well. So I'll, I'll put together an email for everyone who's registered with all of this information. Um, but listen, I'll just finish up by saying thank you so much, Keith. I know it's a bit later for you as well. Um, we really appreciate it. That was really interesting. And... Um, um, great to get that perspective. Thank you in his absence to Rory as well. Um, and thank you everyone for, for coming. And like I was saying, if, if you're interested, we have an event on Wednesday um, that you can register for. And we would like to learn more about some of these issues. Generally every autumn we do a kind of intro to economics course. Um, so you can keep an eye out for that as well. You kind of watch, so that'll be um, on our website and Twitter and all the usual places. Um, but listen, thanks everyone. I'll finish now. Have a lovely evening. Enjoy what's left of the sunshine and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye everybody. Bye. Good night. Thanks.